right? European diplomacy since the Cold War, how ambitious, how inhibited. This public lecture is part of a wider workshop that we have organized on the European Union as a peacemaker and a peacekeeper. The intention was for this workshop to lead into the Nobel Peace Laureates Summit, which was to be held next week, and making play off the fact that the European Union was a recipient of the Nobel Peace Prize in 2012 for its work of bringing European peace amongst the member states and also spreading it in the neighborhood. Uh, unfortunately, only we were able to organize our event. Um, so we're going to head without the Peace Laureates. Um, but on the subject of organization, I'd like to thank the School of History and Sociology, the Sam Nunn School, the T.D. Stern Foundation, and the European Commission for their financial support. The European Commission funds the Center of Excellence, and I must stress, contractually obliged, to tell you that nothing that Lord Wallace says, however insightful, as I S-N-S-N-I-N-S-I-G-H-T-L-Y, <laughs> not with the C, you know, even with the C, cannot be attributed to the commission in any way, shape, or form. Now, Lord Wallace is a member of the British House of Lords, and he's a former emeritus professor at the London School of Economics and Political Science. In 1997, he became a member of the Select Committee on the European Communities and chairman of the Subcommittee on Justice and Affairs. In 2001, he became the Liberal Democrats' main front bench spokesman in the House of Lords on Foreign Affairs, and in November 2004, was elected Joint Deputy Leader of the Liberal Democrat Peers. After the 2010 election, while he was appointed a government whip, acting as government spokesman in the House of Lords, Foreign Commonwealth, Foreign Commonwealth Office, particularly Europe and the Middle East, uh, the election in May mentioned passing, does mean that Lord Wells is able to be with us right now, having a busier job. I should also mention on a personal note um, that William becoming a member of the government had a uh, effect on me directly, because amongst many other things that he'd been doing prior to joining the government, he'd been editing this small book called Policy Making of the European Union, which he'd been editing with William Wall with Helen Wallace and Mark Pollock. Um, he figured running the government and editing the book was probably a bit much. Um, and so Mark had come over to me about uh, replacing him. Um, a classic case of a dodgy substitution. Um, and I should say that even now we're on the seventh edition, so two editions since then, the book is still rightly referred to as Wallace and Wallace. We're delighted to have you here. Thank you. Can I just say for the graduate students who are here that this afternoon when we were sitting in the other conference room with a lot of graduate students sitting around the edge, I, I suddenly remembered a, a, a conference which I organized in 1989, a long time ago, uh, on uh, the dynamics of European integration in Florence, uh, where uh, we had pulled together, as today, quite a lot of people from across uh, both sides of the Atlantic to talk about how they saw European integration going. And I distinctly remember hearing two young students behind me whisper to each other, that can't be Stanley Hoffman. Surely he died 10 years ago. <laughs> well, Stanley actually lasted 25 years longer than that. And, this, uh, and I just want to say to the younger ones here, I'm going to talk about what to you is probably history but which I've lived through, and I'm not dying yet. Um, and that's part of the problem. Uh, having taught international relations for much of my career, uh, that uh, each year you realize that your students uh, know less personally about what happened 20 years ago. Uh, and you have to explain to them, what on earth this funny thing the Cold War was? Uh, it seems quite extraordinary and so on. But, um, what I'm going to talk about is, is European diplomacy since the Cold War, um, in which European governments and the European institutions, dominated by people who'd grown up during the Cold War and had expected the Cold War 
and the American security guarantee to be there as a given, suddenly found themselves in a different world and have tried to cope with it. So I've called it European diplomacy since the Cold War, how ambitious and how inhibited. Because the end of the Cold War should really have been what the Luxembourg Prime Minister called the hour of Europe. Western Europe had had 40 years of democratic government, security and economic recovery and sustained growth under American leadership and protection. The clear and present danger presented by Soviet and other Warsaw Pact forces massed along the frontiers of Central Europe now shrank away. And you had to be there in, in West Germany, 50 kilometers from the frontier, to understand how real that sense of insecurity felt up until 1989. So, all of a sudden, Europe was transformed. The realist world of superpower confrontation, organized in two competing alliances, appears to be giving way to an idealistic world of international cooperation and open frontiers. NATO no longer needed, the European Union the appropriate vehicle for this brave new world. There have always been competing narratives about what some still call the European project, the idealist approach in which power politics and state rivalry would be replaced by peaceful integration, an ever closer union among the peoples of Europe, and the realist version in which the aim was to contain Germany by integrating its economy and government with those of France and its smaller neighbours under watchful American supervision. Both narratives had their adherents in Paris and in Washington, though the realists had greater influence in both. The Brussels institutions, the European community itself, held to the idealist version, as did many in Bonn, which was then the capital of Germany, and the smaller capitals. Views in London were strongly realist, although some appreciated the practical benefits of foreign policy cooperation. Neither France nor Britain envisaged the European community collectively taking over responsibility for political or security relations with their former colonies in Africa, or playing a leading role in the turbulent politics of the Middle East. And the American administration had no intention of allowing strategic relations with either the former Soviet bloc or the Middle East to be defined by its European allies. Europe, in the familiar phrase of European commissioners and others, was a civilian power. NATO managed and defined hard power, deterrence and defence. The European community dealt with soft power, exercised by example, trade concessions and economic assistance. The power of attraction as against the power of denial. Nested within the Atlantic Alliance, European policymakers, Brussels uh, insiders and enthusiasts for further integration above all, had the luxury of moral superiority and an optimistic view of the effectiveness of institution building and soft power on their own. From one perspective, the end of the Cold War was transformative for what then became the European Union. Germany was reunited, becoming again the central state and economy within a wider European state system, which it had been uh, until the Second World War. The countries between Germany and Russia, which had suffered so much during the two world wars and since then, rapidly reoriented towards Western Europe and its established institutions. Under German and French leadership, the European community raised its ambitions and strengthened its powers. The Maastricht Treaty on the European Union, negotiated in 1990-91, to declared in Article J of the Treaty of the European Union that a common foreign and security policy is hereby established, which was intended to lead to, I quote again, the eventual framing of a common defence policy which might in time lead to a common defence. Of course, these were carefully negotiated phrases intended to cover wide gaps in understanding about what, the, what they meant. They were negotiated against the background of the disintegration first of the Soviet Union and then of Yugoslavia and the US-led coalition uh, to push the Iraqi army out of Kuwait in what we now call the first Iraq war, 
yet without any explicit discussion of how such a commitment would affect the European government's engagement in such crises, let alone in the broader problems of the Middle East and Africa, or the un emerging uncertainties of what we called the newly independent states around Russia's shrunken frontiers. The faith that Jean Monnet, the founder, one of the founders of the European Union, had placed in institution building to bring together national politicians and officials to encourage them to discover common solutions and then to implement them was extended from the economic sphere to the international political. It was a leap of faith. West European integration had succeeded in part because the United States, through NATO, had removed the most difficult foreign policy choices from its member governments and had provided protection against the greatest external threats. But the end of the Cold War diffused those threats and didn't remove them. So what I want to talk about next is the tensions between prioritizing institution building or learning through shared experience in operation deployment and defining strategic objectives. These have dogged European external ambitions from then until now. The institutions have gradually emerged through successive revisions of the treaties and restructuring of the European Commission. First, a high <coughs> representative for foreign and security policy, then the European External Action Service, and in the 2014 Commission, an attempt to reduce institutional and bureaucratic rivalries by embedding the high representative inside the Commission more firmly and grouping the several commissioners responsible for other aspects of external relations under the high representative in her capacity as Commission Vice President. In principle, the European Union is now equipped with a wide range of instruments for promoting peacemaking and peace building. It has a sizable external budget, representation on the ground across the world through the External Action Service, a series of technical assistance programs to uh, developing countries, the ability to appoint, special to appoint special representatives to act on behalf of the EU and its governments in specific crises, a military committee uh, rep uh, of national uh, military officers to coordinate uh, military contributions to joint operations, rotating battle groups uh, c consisting of uh, national forces assigned to these for rapid deployment when needed, a European Defence Agency to promote common procurement and training, a civil military cell to pull together different capabilities for conflict resolution and rebuilding weak states, a modest but growing capacity uh, within the External Action Service and the Commission for Risk Assessment and Planning, and a European Union Institute of Security Studies to provide additional expertise. American officials have sometimes envied the formal capability of the EU to pull together in this way the different civil, military and humanitarian dimensions needed for effective intervention in conflict ridden or failing states, arguing as a result for closer coordination between NATO's limited capabilities and the EU's wider competencies. But national governments pursuing their own policies and occasionally their own interventions in parallel with those negotiated at the EU level retain effective vetoes over any common action. It's their forces that have to be deployed, their staff that have to be mobilized to deal with pandemics or refugee flows. The battle groups, sadly, have never been deployed, in spite of at least one specific request from the United Nations. A civilian power that had to rely on contract aircraft from Ukraine for heavy airlift when managing conflicts across Africa now relies most heavily on British Air Force-owned uh, American aircraft. Though the gradual deployment at last of national fleets of A400 Airbus transports will widen the sources of supply. Years of argument over whether or not to create a common European operational headquarters have pitied the British, who are willing to deploy forces but don't want uh, a formal EU institution umbrella against the Germans who are committed to a formal headquarters but don't want to deploy. The most effective instruments available to the European Union in promoting peaceful transition and the resolution of conflict has of course been the blend of financial and technical assistance, market access and political conditionality involved in the process 
of accession to European Union membership, which Helen Wallace will be addressing tomorrow in our conference. The pattern had been established well before the Cold War ended in managing the transition of Spain, Portugal and Greece. From 1990 onwards, it was adapted to manage the more difficult transitions of the former socialist states of East Central Europe, anxious to integrate with their Western neighbours, but underestimating the difficulties of adapting their legal, political and strategic uh, structures to meet the conditions set. In retrospect, there's a tendency to describe Eastern enlargement as a successful strategy. Sympathisers for the current Russian perspective even argue as the Russians do, that the European Union, along with NATO, actively pushed enlargement onto the former socialist states. We should remember how reluctant most member states were to enlarge at the outset, and how hard the states in transition pressed to be allowed to join far sooner than rich and comfortable West European governments and their publics were willing to accept. I recall visits to Budapest and Prague in 1990, where eager ministers expressed their confidence about the welcome Western Europe would provide for what they described as their return to Europe. In December 1991, I was part of a group of advisors assembled by Harvard's Kennedy School, which took part in a conference in Kiev on foreign policy priorities for Ukraine, a state which had at that point been formally independent for two or three weeks. The Foreign Minister arrived late, fresh from his first meeting with the US Secretary of State and delighted that the US Secretary of State had spent four hours longer in Ukraine than he had in Kazakhstan, and proud that he had been granted so much time with representatives of the world's most powerful democratic state. He told us, as I recall, that Ukraine had two strategic priorities for the next two years. The first, to join NATO, and the second, to join the EU. My American colleagues very unkindly asked me to explain that these would not be as easy to achieve as he imagined. Uh, then, and for over two decades since, European governments have been reluctant to spell out how far enlargement should reach or where it must stop. It's not my purpose here to assess the process of Eastern enlargement, though some might comment that its application to the Eastern Balkan states of Romania and Bulgaria was deficient, and that applying the same template to the several small and weak states of the Western Balkans is proving increasingly difficult. What I do want to query is the adaptation of this institutional model to countries which were not being offered the prospect of full membership through first the Eastern and then the southern neighbourhood policies, that's the countries around Russia and the countries in the southern Mediterranean. Standard operating procedures, adapted from earlier processes, managed by the Commission without full engagement by many or even most governments, which failed to address the underlying complexities of the states and societies to which they were applied, let alone the geopolitical implications of pursuing an avowedly technical approach across such sensitive regions without thinking through how Russia or other Muslim states might react. And I pass over the long saga of negotiations with Turkey over the prospect of full membership, a process which began now nearly 50 years ago. The application of these technical procedures the Commission had developed in managing East European enlargement to the Eastern neighbourhood states and then, at the insistence of the European Union's Mediterranean members, also to the southern neighbours, was a classic example of following institutional habits rather than considering the diversity of local circumstances and the broader strategic context. Member states with divergent interests co coalesced around the idea of neighbourhood policies that looked appropriate from the perspective of Brussels, but desperately unsuitable from the perspective of Tbilisi, Yerevan, Tunis, or Tripoli. Anna Menon will address this in more detail tomorrow. We should also note the inadequacy of other institutional arrangements to which the EU attached importance as foreign policy cooperation developed. Regular summits between the EU presidency and the American administration have been established in the 1970s at the insistence of Washington. Once the Europeans wanted to have foreign policy consultations amongst, uh, amongst themselves, the Americans said, we have to be there, we want to know what you're doing, 
we'd like to be in the room, ideally. And the result was six monthly summits agreed at high level between uh, the President of the European Council, then a rotating post, and the US administration, even the President. So uh, ministers like the foreign ministers uh, or uh, prime ministers of Ireland and Belgium were delighted by the opportunity to walk proud in Washington with their photograph taken alongside the President. Um, but these fell back to annual events in the 1990s, partly because American presidents had less incentive after the Cold War to travel to Europe. And I'm now told uh, that annual meetings remain an aspiration, but the last two such meetings were in November 2011 and March 2014. After the Cold War, the EU also pursued what it defined as a strategic partnership with Russia, with regular high-level meetings that have not been sustained. ASEAN EU summit, equipped with gaudy shirts for all visiting European leaders to wear, had been sustained for rather longer, but they're less serious, and the institutionalization of gatherings for which the agenda was not clear hasn't proved to be a very useful instrument. So how about practical experience? Learning by doing, if you like. Practical experience has often been bitter, but has accumulated some valuable lessons. The collapse of Yugoslavia immediately after the end of the Cold War, which was a state that many people in Western Europe expected to be the first in the post-Cold War queue for EU accession, but which then disintegrated <coughs> instead as underlying historic divisions and enmities <coughs> came to the surface, didn't fit the EU's categorization of transition or the expectations of its governments. In the process of managing uh, the post-Yugoslav crisis, Britain and France learned to cooperate with each other and to respect the quality of their respective armed forces as they struggled with the constraints of the initial UN mandate. The French also learned the usefulness of NATO command structures and shifted their attitude towards cooperation between the EU and NATO. The Dutch learned the most bitter lesson of the dangers of imprecise mandates and inadequate forces in efforts of peacekeeping in the experience of their small contingent failing to protect Bosnians in Srebrenica from massacre by Serb forces. Franco-British cooperation in the field laid part of the foundation for what became the Franco-British European Defence Initiative of 1998. That was intended, amongst other objectives, to persuade the German government to follow the French in modifying the size and structure of German armed forces, still at that point uh, there to, to meet the Soviet forces uh, in the event uh, of uh, war in Central Europe, uh, to adapt in the way that first British and then French forces had adapted to, to permit deployment outside Europe in peacekeeping or conflict resolution missions. There followed, for about three years, extensive and ambitious discussions uh, amongst European Union members about strengthening European defence cooperation, which involved at one stage over 20 working groups, which uh, agreed all sorts of plans which finance ministries vetoed, um, and uh, at the end of it all, uh, little progress was achieved, leading to deep cynicism in London above all of later institutional initiatives by the Belgian government and others, which appeared uh, to want new institutions but not to put forces or funds behind them. Many EU uh, states have deployed forces abroad during these years, though almost always outside the EU framework, in UN peacekeeping forces, NATO deployments, or other mi missions. As many as 70,000 at one point, and around 50,000 for sustained periods over years, as Bastien Gigerich, now the ISS, has noted. Britain and France learned the limits of multilateral intervention and the advances of unilateral action in terms of clearer decision taking and rapid deployment. The French have done a number of deployments in weak states in Africa and have attempted on many occasions to convert their interventions in the Democratic Republic of Congo 
Chad, the Central African Republic, into EU operations, placing particular pressure on the German government to make a significant contribution, but without sustained success. The British in Sierra Leone observed what was then the largest UN peacekeeping operation, failing to contain increasing disorder, and sent in a small number of special forces which succeeded where 27,000 UN peacekeepers had failed. Slowly and cumulatively, the EU has accumulated experience of civilian, civil military and military missions, first in Southeast Europe and then across Africa, south of the Sahara. Operations in the Western Balkans followed UN and NATO missions which had contained significant forces from EU member states. Operations in and around the Horn of Africa have in some ways been the most successful. The naval operation at Atalanta, commanded by an integrated staff based in the UK's Joint Forces HQ in North London, played a major role in reducing the level of piracy in the Western Indian Ocean, while parallel training and capacity building missions in Somalia made moderate progress in returning a degree of order to that disordered land. So, Somalia, anti-piracy missions, moderate success, though not in, particularly on land in Somalia, yet complete. Across the Sahel, EU training missions for armed forces and police now work in parallel with national teams, one of them the first ever joint british irish military operation which, if you understand relations between Britain and Ireland, is a major step forward. Um, though overshadowed by much larger scale uh, French military engagement. Um, several EU national air forces flew over Libya two years ago in a NATO operation, and several are now flying over Iraq, some even over Syria, within a broad international commission under American command. Naval forces are working together to contain the flow of refugees across the Mediterranean, although the difficulties that EU member states have faced in formulating a coherent common response to the current migration crisis has limited the scope of that mission. The most successful model of working together, I would argue, has been the long process of negotiations with Iran, which have been primarily about military nuclear capabilities, but which have broader implications for the containment of long-term conflict across the Middle East. It's very significant that the negotiating group has been described by the United States, Russia and China as the P5 plus one, the five permanent members of the United Nations plus Germany, but have been described by the Germans, British and French as the E3 plus three, the three Europeans and the others. <laughs> The EU's high representative acted as an additional member of the group, accepted by Iranian negotiators as a partly neutral and highly trusted interlocutor. Of course, the American negotiating team were key to the process and the Russians difficult but unavoidable partners, but the three major EU governments, the E3, discovered the depths of their common interests and worked effectively with the high representative to contribute to, so far, a successful conclusion. So what about strategic thinking? What threats, what responses should Europe make? That was the, the biggest inhibition behind the Maastricht Treaty, a deep unwillingness of most governments to talk about what sort of policies we needed now that the Berlin Wall was down and the Soviet Union no longer existed. There was a really deep inhibition about rethinking their national strategic concepts, let alone their shared concepts, in the wake of this amazing transformation of the geopolitical context marked by the reunification of Germany, the withdrawal of the Red Army to behind the Russian frontier, and the lifting of Cold War rivalries that had run through the Western Balkans, across the Mediterranean, and through Africa and the Middle East. Looking back, it's astonishing that developed democracies with government planning staffs and parliamentary foreign affairs and defense committees with respected think tanks and university centers for studying international affairs should have felt so inhibited 
about reconsidering the threats and challenges that faced them and the appropriate national and European responses. In 1994-5, I worked with a number of research students at Oxford uh, to examine the different national debates within European countries over the strategic implications of the end of the Cold War, an exercise that later emerged as a volume edited by Robin Niblett and myself entitled Rethinking European Order. We started from the assumption that there must have been a series of active national debates given the growth of expertise and specialised institutions over the previous 40 years across Western Europe, both within and outside governments. We looked at the United Kingdom, Germany, France, Spain, Italy, the Netherlands and Sweden. And we were struck by the deep inhibitions in capital after capital about openly addressing the scale of the transformation in Europe's strategic context. About its implications for the future of NATO, for the stability of the new states emerging from the collapse of the Soviet Union, and for those states across Africa and the Middle East that had maintained a degree of stability and a lot of external financial support as clients of one side or another under Cold War rivalries. West European states moved quickly to reduce their defence budgets and personnel, but left it to American leadership and to declarations at European councils to define strategic problems and priorities. Only in 2003, 12 years after the Maastricht Treaty, did the European Union succeed in publishing for the first time its own European security strategy. The sad story of that strategic document and the absence of any substantive redrafting since then is worth retelling. The strategy itself was drafted by a British official then in the High Representative's office uh, to demonstrate to a US administration with strong tendencies to act unilaterally that its European partners did have a coherent perspective. It was more easily available in draft in Washington, where I first obtained a copy at a transatlantic conference, than in Brussels or any of the EU's national capitals. When adopted, after limited discussion among foreign ministers and in the European Council, it, lead, it, it received little further publicity. I wrote around a network of academics then covering the evolution of European cooperation in foreign policy to ask how much attention it had received in national media or parliaments and was told that only the Finnish parliament had conducted a full inquiry on its relevance for national policy. Good for the Finns. Uh, lousy for everyone else. Part of the problem was that successive American administrations from 1990 onwards wanted to retain strategic leadership over the future of Europe after the Cold War. Papers and proposals flowed from Washington promoting NATO engagement as well as that of the EU, launching NATO dialogues with Russia, Ukraine and the North African states, alongside and in some ways in competition with the European Union. The most disastrous of these strategic initiatives culminated in the NATO Bucharest summit in 2008, when reluctant European governments acquiesced in the Bush administration's drive to offer the prospect of NATO full membership to Georgia and Ukraine. Enlargement of NATO to the Baltic states had early been announced by President Clinton in a speech to Baltic American groups in Chicago. Domestic American politics and global strategy muddled up together. Yet major European governments did not challenge US strategic leadership or actively spell out alternative visions of European architecture or order. Governments in London instinctively looked to Washington for leadership while those in Berlin preferred to avoid strategic thinking. Thinkers in Paris claimed greater autonomy, but their strategic thinking was clearer on Africa than on wider global trends. Academics have investigated the poverty of what they call strategic culture in European capitals, in large states and small. There's been a deep reluctance to accommodate to the challenges of a more diverse and disordered world, let alone to come to any common view about an appropriate European response. For smaller European states, the European Union itself provided a means of putting off critical re-examination of national priorities. The Foreign Minister of one of the smaller West European states told me nearly 20 years after the Berlin Wall came down, the, the EU's procedures in some ways 
and made it easier to avoid difficult choices at national level. I quote, as I recall him, uh, we go to Brussels, we negotiate and sign some sterling paragraphs on common foreign and defence policy, and come home satisfied that we have achieved something real, without recognising that if we and others do nothing to implement what has been agreed, nothing will happen. Uh, wonderful sort of avoidance uh, thing. You sign declarations and that's it. Enlargement itself has made coherence more difficult in a field in which national governments and national capabilities remain key to the authorisation of common action. 26 to 28 foreign ministers start from a far more diverse set of interests and perceptions than 9 or 12. Smaller states have smaller sets of interests, as visits I made when in government to the capital of some smaller states brought home vividly, listening to their foreign ministers uh, defining how far their interests went, uh, sometimes not as far as a thousand kilometers from their national borders. Baltic member states, of course, attack, attach much lower priority to North Africa than to Russia, while Mediterranean states take the opposite view. In the federal United States, the executive clout of Washington imposes foreign policy priorities on the 50 diverse states, but the EU is a weak confederation where national capitals retain their own international perspectives. So where are we now in terms of ambitions and inhibitions? It's difficult to find appropriate criteria against which to assess the EU's record. Uh, in managing the unstable regions around its borders over the last 25 years. The extension of membership, economic prosperity, political stability and democratic values across East Central Europe, much of Southeastern Europe and the Baltic states, has been a clear success, in spite of continuing problems over political liberties and corruption in some member states. Stabilisation, conflict prevention and resolution across the weak states of Africa has attracted a great deal of money and technical assistance with mixed success, although some would argue that the problems African societies face in terms of population increase and rapid social and economic transformation have been intractable, so it was very difficult to do better. States such as Eritrea, from which in 2013 to 2014 nearly a third of the migrants or refugees trafficked across the Mediterranean were drawn, have continued to fester without effective EU intervention. Conflict within Sudan, the largest state in Africa until it was divided, now continuing as overlapping conflicts within Sudan and southern Sudan, has persisted throughout a long series of UN, EU and other interventions, including highly paid special representatives from all of these organisations. I note that the three non-African governments most active in attempting to mediate among the factions in southern Sudan in the past two years have been Norway, the United States and the United Kingdom. Not very much EU activity there. The migrant surge from sub-Saharan Africa was predicted many years ago. European intervention in Libya alongside the Americans and with UN authorization inadvertently opened the door wider than before. Have European governments now learned to take a shared political strategic approach to Russia? All three of the EU states with global diplomatic ambitions until recently preferred commercial diplomacy while allowing the EU collectively to pursue partnerships with Ukraine and Georgia which were divorced from any political analysis of Russia's likely response. Powerful business lobbies within Germany long dominated their relationship with Moscow. Russian money has flowed freely into and through London, some of it undoubtedly laundered from corrupt activities within Russia or elsewhere. The French even contracted to build and sell helicopter carriers to Russia, only breaking the contract after the occupation of Crimea and the shooting down of a civilian airliner. Those two combined shocks have now pushed the EU into the imposition of a targeted sanctions regime which, together with the sustained fall in international oil prices, has clearly impacted on Russian policy and demonstrated an effective foreign policy instrument 
that the EU can wield when all of its members agree. It's too soon to tell whether the migration crisis will similarly push our reluctant European Union towards a more coherent approach to the immensely complicated politics of the Middle East Muslim world. I must stress how acute the migration crisis is for European states. The number of refugees crossing the Mediterranean and the borders between Turkey and the EU in the first nine months of 2015, half a million, was double the number for the full 12 months of 2014. Some estimates anticipate nearly a million by the end of this year, with a further surge as the weather begins to improve in the spring and the destruction of Syria continues. I saw in one uh, newspaper I read yesterday the suggestion that there might be three million refugees trying to reach the EU in 2016. Um, at the present moment, uh, in the last four weeks, 200,000 refugees have crossed the frontier between Croatia and Slovenia. Slovenia is a country of two million people, so that's 10% of the country's population additionally arriving in four weeks. That's a scale of movement that's very difficult to comprehend. The overwhelming majority of those arriving are from Syria, Iraq, Eritrea, and Afghanistan, but also Ethiopians, Somalis, Sudanese, Nigerians, and others. Until recently, European policies towards the Sunni Arab states were also largely commercial, with Britain and France competing vigorously to sell weapons systems to Saudi Arabia and the Gulf states. Now, Dutch and Belgian military aircraft, as well as British and French, are flying missions against ISIS under overall American command. The greatest inhibition against the development of any coherent policy in the Middle East is the complexity of the conflict, with the Saudis, Turks, Emiratis, and Qataris all pursuing competing priorities, the Kurds the most effective resistance against ISIS, and the Russians and Iranians putting support for the Syrian regime above fighting the Islamic State. The Valletta Conference this week, uh, a European special meeting at heads of government level on how to deal with the migration crisis, which is still underway, may mark the beginning of a shift under intense pressure towards a more united response. With several million Syrians in camps in Lebanon, Jordan and Turkey, it was short-sighted of the majority of EU members to contribute so little financially to their underfunded UN management. Britain, criticised by its neighbours for accepting so few of the arriving refugees, has criticised the Germans and others in return for failing to underwrite conditions in the camps that might persuade their desperate inhabitants to stay there a little longer. The strains on Sweden and Germany, the greatest targets for refugee arrivals, are now acute though member states which have attracted fewer do not feel the same pressure. The interaction between Europe's established Muslim communities and the rise of anti-Western Islamism is an active concern for a minority of EU members, though I am not aware of any public dialogue across borders on how to support a more moderate version of Islam in Europe. Mrs. Mogherini, the current High Representative, has now embarked on a determined effort to draft a new European security strategy using her institutional position and the External Action Service to attempt to focus the attention of member governments on common challenges and threats that are now so visible. We may hope that this time national governments, parliaments and media will respond to the final draft by promoting an informed debate. But she, like others in the European institutions, is painfully aware that the effective implementation of European foreign policy depends on the E3, Germany, France and the UK, the three states that together account for half of Europe's defence spending and much of its external trade, overseas aid and diplomatic reach. All three governments are preoccupied by domestic concerns. The UK government is distracted by preparation for a referendum on EU membership although its Prime Minister has just reminded his public that EU membership is important to Britain's national security. The French government is struggling with a weak economy and domestic resistance to reform. The German Chancellor has emerged for the moment as Europe's 
uh, most e effective international leader in practice, although she too is hemmed in by domestic resistance to mass immigration and resistance to German spending on deployments outside the EU. So, the EU represents a zone of peace and stability now surrounded on three sides by rising disorder, which is also spilling over within the EU's borders. It has gradually developed a number of institutions and instruments for exerting international influence, though not yet any underlying consensus about the purposes they should serve or the threats to which they should respond. Peacekeeping and peacemaking in weak African states and the seas around them, while the United States managed potentially more serious threats in the Middle East and around Russia, is now having to give way to collectively confronting major challenges to the East and the South, with policymakers in Washington expecting NATO's European members to look after their own region. It's not easy to judge how well the member governments of the European Union and their useful but still fragile common institutions will cope with this more difficult challenge. Thanks. Thank you very much for that presentation, which was admirable in its breadth, both in terms of time and space. Um, I'm also for the melding of academic analysis with practitioner insight, which you may know bridging the gap between academia and the policy world is all the rage here in America. So, oh, New York, the they embodied, are. physical embodiment of that inspiration. So we have a little bit of time uh, for questions. There's no shortage of material. We'll turn it over to you. There's a huge disconnect between the British domestic debate and British foreign policy. Um, in practice, uh, British defence policy over the last few years has developed closer cooperation with the French, with the Dutch, and with various other countries across Europe. Government doesn't talk about that because Eurosceptics within Britain are not happy about anything which might look like moves towards defence integration in Europe, but that's what happens on the ground. Um, in terms of foreign policy, Britain looks less effective already than it did five or ten years ago. Negotiations with Russia and Ukraine are being conducted by the Germans and the French, the British largely absent, um, and um, France is now in many ways more influential over um, the Emiratis, the Union of Arab Emirates, and the Saudis uh, than the British are. So I would argue that, that because the question of whether or not Britain will stay within the European Union is, is on the agenda, Britain has already lost influence uh, in foreign policy. If we were to move out, we would lose influence further, but then we're having a great debate about national identity in which we've convinced ourselves that if we only were, we controlled our sovereignty, you know, we would somehow be stronger again, which is a debate which goes back 20, 30 years and doesn't much relate to the threats we now face. Thank you, of course, for an excellent presentation of today's problems. Uh, from, from my point of view, the euro uh, was missing, but uh, that's excuse for the subject, obviously. Um, I would like to profit from the opportunity to ask you about uh, the upcoming uh, referendum on membership in the European Union, if uh, it's placed an assumption of what's going to happen in the UK in the months to come. Thank you. I think... I'm old enough to have been involved in the last referendum. My wife, indeed, was one of the coordinators 
uh, for the uh, stay in campaign in, in the northwest of England. Um, and we are both remember acutely that two months before the referendum, the opinion polls were showing a strong uh, negative vote, and it swung round to two to one in favour of staying. So anyone who says now they know what the result will be is clearly out of their mind. We're worried, we're worried by a number of things. Um, one of the reasons, I think, why David Cameron, the British Prime Minister, is at the moment actively interested in trying to have the referendum before next summer is because he fears that a, a summer surge of refugees across the Mediterranean on the scale which I've just been suggesting will interfere with the British debate where immigration is one of the, the, the most difficult issues uh, for those who want to leave or want to stay or are making their minds up. Therefore, immigration would get in the way of the referendum and, and push people to go out. What happens inside the Eurozone, of course, is crucially important. Um, if the Eurozone actually starts to grow again in the next six months, it will be much easier to settle the argument that Britain has to stay in. If the Eurozone starts to contract, that will make it much more difficult to make the case for staying in. So there are a range of factors that will come into play as well as the quality of the campaigns on either side and what position the Prime Minister eventually takes himself. Uh, could you speak a little to the tension between um, Frederica Mogherini and uh, powerful Prime Ministers of uh, Germany and, uh, and the President of France? Um, the high representative has influence but not power. And she has to understand how you play that. Same is true of the, the, the new post of the President of the European Council. Um, national, major national foreign ministers um, from the five or six countries all have their own views as to what they have. Some of the smaller uh, foreign ministers don't have the same sort of vision. And of course, part of the tension in all of this is if you're a small state, actually having a European External Action Service, which has got a post in Mali and another one in Senegal, which you could never think of having yourselves, is a great advantage. It means that Slovenia or Slovakia has access to things it didn't have before. If you're Germany, which has the largest diplomatic service in Europe now, or France, which has the second, or Britain, which has the third, you're not sure you want other people to take over what you yourselves do. Now, Mrs. Marguerini has to, to negotiate between all of those things. What I was suggesting is Cathy Ashton, her predecessor, uh, decided that she would do a limited number of things and try and do them well. She succeeded extremely well on the Iran dossier, where she appears to have gained the trust of the Iranian negotiating team, but that was at the cost of not doing some other things that perhaps she ought to have done in Africa and elsewhere. So uh, it, it's an almost impossible task. Uh, Mrs. Mogherini at the moment is trying to get governments to think about what sort of coherent policy they should have as a whole. And as I've suggested, you know, what do we do about Russia? which then incorporates how Russia handles relations with Georgia, Ukraine, Belarus, Azerbaijan, Armenia, the countries around it. Uh, what do we do about the conflict in the Middle East? And a major part of that is what on earth do we do about Turkey at the present moment? Turkey, which is a, uh, a member of NATO, formerly an ally, uh, but which is strongly opposed to what the United States and the major European governments regard as the most effective fighting force against ISIS. The German government has just, for the first time, dropped German weapons to forces involved in conflict, to the Kurds. It's a major innovation for the Germans. Um, now, that does not please the Turks at all. And so 
how on earth we manage a coherent policy towards a very complex Sunni, Shia, Turkish, Kurdish, Turkmen uh, conflict is much more difficult for us. And then Africa is getting worse. Um, again, I, I was reading something on the, on the plane which, which pointed out that the speed, the speed at which population is rising uh, across Central Africa means that there is no way that countries with weak economies and highly corrupt governments can provide employment for a very large number of, of their younger population. The only thing to do is to get out and go north. So a huge set of problems which I suppose one should say as an observer, the European Union isn't doing too well in coping with these, but then if you actually look at how the Americans are coping with them, let alone how the Russians are coping with them, and the Chinese trying to avoid taking any decisions on it, we're not doing that much worse than anyone else. <laughs> we have time for one quick question and answer. Um, perhaps just because we haven't talked about it much, where do you see the European Union fitting in with what is going on over in China and in that part of Asia versus we've talked a lot about North Africa and the Middle East? China is very distant in geopolitical terms. Um, and although there are some people, particularly connected with the British Navy, who make nonsensical remarks about how we really ought to be out there uh, with the Americans in the South China Sea if needed, the, the number of frigates we've now got, there's no way we could ever do it. Um, so I, we are all at a distance from the geopolitical China-US conflict. Um, I think that none of the European states have yet begun to face up to the highly mercantilist Chinese drive. And we've just had a, I think, frankly, embarrassing uh, Chinese, Chinese visit to Britain, at which we were trying to invite Chinese investment in highly sensitive uh, British areas. The British have this sense that the Germans have cultivated China terribly well, and that's why they sell four times as much uh, as the British do to China. But um, we haven't yet really had a coherent discussion or analysis of how stable China is, uh, how one deals with this accumulation of external reserves through highly mercantilist means, which is what China is doing. Um, and thus, I, I, I have to say, not only does the European Union not have a coherent policy towards China, I'm not aware of any European state which has a coherent policy towards China. And perhaps I might just add as last, seven or eight years ago, I was in Beijing um, with um, a former student of mine who'd become the LSE's country representative for China. There are more Chinese students in Britain than American these days. Um, and we were invited, he being Irish, to an evening at the Irish Embassy in Beijing, to which the Irish ambassador had invited the Austrian ambassador, and uh, the ambassadors of several smaller EU member states. And since so they were just discussing the creation of the European External Action Service and what that would mean, I tried to get them to tell me what it was that was unique about the Austrian relationship with China or the Irish relationship with China. We had the most fascinating even though they all fell apart, unable to explain quite what it was, but they all wanted to retain their different embassies in China. That's part of the problem. China is economically terribly attractive if you think you can export to it and as a source of investment, but politically it's extremely difficult and we haven't really come to terms with it. We've now, I guess we, the, 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 I think the answer to your last question is EU's not doing great, but as well as anybody else, I guess is kind of a way to say. No, a sobering place to leave the conversation. No, no worse than no that. Yeah. <laughs> a sobering place to uh, uh, leave the topic. But thank you again very much for sharing. This. American policy in the Middle East has not been, you know, one of them. <laughs>
most glorious.